coming. Uh, my name is Jonas Bonier. I'm the CTO of Lightbend. Um, also created the Aka project back in the day, and Lightbend sort of is the company behind Aka, Scala, Logom, Play Framework, etc. Uh, let's get right into it. So we've been spoiled. We as developers have been spoiled by this once believed almighty on monolith. You know, with this single SQL database and one thread per request and and sort of strong coupling uh, for way too long. Uh, the problem is that it's really a, f a fictional world, a fairy tale world where, where we are, where we can actually, actually rightfully so assume one single now um, and one single, um, so always strong consistency. And uh, where we can easily forget about I mean, the university classes we took on, di on distributed systems sometimes, some time ago. Well, knock, knock. Who's there? Reality. I mean, we have been living an, in an illusion, pretty far from reality, actually. Uh, you know, to, to, today applications are, de are deployed from everything, from mobile devices to, to like big cloud computing clusters running thousands of multi-core processors. And, and uh, even our phone is multi-core nowadays, right? And users are extremely demanding. They expect millisecond re res res response time and sometimes I mean, close to 100% uptime, which is, which, which is of course impossible, but, but the expectations are there. And this means that traditional architectures, the way we have built systems, simply won't cut it anymore. We need new tools for this new world. We can't make the horse faster anymore. We need cars for, for, for where we're going to steal uh, Henry Ford's quote, which I'm told he actually didn't say. But anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a good one. It's, it's, it's really time to wake up, time to retire the monolith, time to decompose our systems into discrete services that can be de 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 developed individually, can be rolled out individually, upgraded individually, fail individually without taking down the whole system with it. Scaled individually, so you can scale the system alongside different axes, etc. And <clears throat> these, these sort of services have had many names over the years. We've sort of done full circle again as an, as an industry. That's what we do. But hopefully we get a little, little, little better every single time around. Now we call them microservices. They used to be called SOA and, you know, and, and the core by DCOM. And we, we've tried this a bunch of times, but, but uh, now microservices is the name of the game. But it's really important to just not to drink the Kool-Aid, even though everyone's talking about microservices. Microservices, it comes with a cost. And everything is trade-offs in computer science. You know it, I know it. So I think, I just, this is just one caveat, that we need to think for ourselves, and not just do what everyone tells you to do, including me. And it's, also, it's also a fact that no one really wants microservices. I mean, it's not, even though um, it's really buzzworthy, et cetera. The monolith is actually a lot easier. And, and uh, in the same case, that no one really wants concurrency. No one wants distributed systems. No one wants eventual consistency and all these things that people talk about. They are necessary evils. So microservices, I say, is a necessary evil to get to accomplish your problem, to get where you want to be, and to not die doing so. So today we're going to look at microservices from, from uh, not from sort of the, the scale the organization and scale the development and et cetera, <clears throat> and the ops world, but upgrading things, et cetera, perspective, but from an architecture and design perspective and put it in its true architectural context, which is distributed systems, okay? So let's say we have a monolith. <clears throat> um, J regular JE, Java EE application using JPA, Oracle database perhaps, etc. And we want to slice this one up into, into microservices. Uh, <clears throat> often what we look, well, what we end up is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> oh, is, is, is something like this, where we have sort of single instance services communicating over REST. Blocking REST, blocking HTTP, runs in a Docker container, still using synchronous blocking to, to in the best case, sort of uh, d d d d different databases, or at least one database with, with sort of dedicated schemas, but also way too often just one single database with one single schema. 
the problem here is that we've built ourselves a set of microliths. I mean, microliths is sort of something that are made up, but it's sort of, we can define it as sort of a single instance microservice. It's sort of a, sort of a micro monolith. And, and in, in the microlith sort of state and behavior is coupled. You rely on synchronous execution, taking your, your, your sort of uh, synchronous method dispatch you had in the monolith and simply replacing them with synchronous HTTP calls. Taking the synchronous JDBC or, or database access and just and continue to using that as is, right? Please note the really sharp edges here. I mean, expect to get hurt here if you start messing with these things. And th so it's really by def the, the, the microlith is really by definition not resilient because a single entity can't possibly be up if it's down, right? And it's, it's, it's also by definition not elastic because you can't scale a single thing. So it's really important to, 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 to in the spirit of Carl Hewitt, understand that micro, one microservice is no microservice, really. Microservices, they come in systems. Okay. And just like we humans need, we need to collaborate with each other and help out, help each other out, dedicate, I mean, rely on other people's skills when we don't have them, etc., to solve problems. Microservices, they behave the, the, the same. It's really a sort of anthropomorphic, I think, way of looking at it, right? Where, where, you, where, you, where, you have, where, where you bring in the human qualities into the way you think about the systems. And it's also just as with humans, it's in the collaboration with others that a lot of the, the hard things are. I mean, how do you make a group of people to communicate that really doesn't know each other that well, etc. I mean, the communication issues, etc. And what's, it's also important to understand that what's really hard in microservices is not the individual microservice itself, which is actually quite, quite easy to implement. It's all the things around them. It's sort of the space in between the instances. There you have things like discovery, I mean, service discovery coordination, security replication, data consistency, data replication, you fail over, things like deployment integration with other systems, et cetera, et cetera, right? And also, as soon as we sort of exit this sort of boundary of the service, we enter a, non, a completely non-deterministic world of distributed systems. That's where distributed systems, you know, play. So you can, you, I can see services in wild ocean, you know, of non-determinism. And, and, you know, distributed systems are hard. And, 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 and it's really where systems fail in the most spectacular ways, right? Where, 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 where information gets lost, where information gets, get, get, gets, gets garbled, where, where sort of information can be reordered, and where failure detection is actually more of a black science, black art. It's, 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 it's something that you can't, it's almost not a science anymore, really, because it's a guessing game. You can't really be sure if, if a node is up and down 100% sure. You need to be able to take educated guesses, of course, based on, on imp empirical data, etc. But still, it's really, really hard. But the, but the interesting thing is that it's, this world, this space in between, opens up for all the things that gives us ways to scale the system, but gives us resilience, because you, 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 you can do replication and run things on multiple nodes, so you have re redundancy. <clears throat> it gives us isolation, which is also one of the core traits in, this, in, in microservices systems, etc. What is really important to understand, the systems need to exploit reality. There's a lot to win here by looking at how, how does the world actually work? And, 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 and try to build a system that closely mimics that, that behaves as the problem we're trying to solve, not sort of trying to shoehorn everything into the old mindset of thinking that we're used to. Okay? This, this opens up for a lot of opportunities and actually also constraints, but as we all know, constraints can actually be liberating can make things easier to think in terms of constraints. Well, one, and one of these constraints is that information has latency. It's the fact that information can not travel faster than the speed of light, and it most often actually fa travels considerably slower than, than the speed of light. This means the communication of information has latency. It takes a while for you to hear what I'm saying, even though I mean, it's almost negligible in this case. As, 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 Pat, as Pat Helen said, exploit, is there, the contents of a message are always from the past. It's never now. Okay. 
So exploiting reality also means to coming, coming at peace with the fact that information is always from the past. It's always representing some sort of historic event, and now it's sort of something that happened in the past. So now it's sort of in the eye of the beholder. Okay, we're sort of always looking into the past. The reality is actually not consistent. There is no single now in the in in reality, really. Everything is relative. But we are sort of trying to maintain this illusion that we are in control of the present, we are in control of now, and there is one, one now. But just simply because it makes things a lot easier for us to reason about. But it's, it's, it's a really big mistake to try to shoehorn that into, into the way we model the systems. I'll talk more about that later. So because the cost of maintaining this illusion is extremely high. It can be, it can be defined as two things. Contention, that is we're waiting for shared resources, Incoherency, way, sort of the delay for data to become co co consistent, the work that needs to be done to maintain this consistency. And this affects daily life, not, not, not just computer science. And it's, uh, the first one, contention, is, is usually defined as Amdahl's law, if, you, if, you, if you've heard about that, that the effect that contention has on parallel systems, that it gives you sort of diminishing returns. I, I, ideally, we should, sh we should get sort of linearly scale as we had processors, as we had nodes, etc. But that's not the case, right? Um, I won't go into detail of the math of Amdahl, but you can, you can look it up. The truth is actually even darker, I'd say, because the truth is actually closer to Neil Ginter's universal scalability law that adds coherency to, to the mix. Not just contention, but also the work that needs to be done to keep these, these whatever processors or nodes in sync. And, and, and that can give us sort of negative results. So after, after a while, I mean, of diminishing returns, you start actually losing performance, losing out on adding resources, because the work needed to, 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 to make all these function as one system eats up all the benefits. Okay? And, and as latency get, gets higher, as it does in a distributed system, this illusion cracks more and more and more, because the difference between the past and the current present is greater in a distributed system. And as Pat, as Pat Helen said, says, in a distributed system, you can know where the work is done and you can know when the work is done, but you simply cannot know both. You have to choose. Okay? So what we have to do is we have to strive to minimize coupling and communication, let's say. Strong consistency, shoehorning the world into this single global now, is extremely expensive, as I said, or even more so in a distributed system. It really puts an upper bound a ceiling on what can be done in terms of reliability and resilience, scalability, et, et, et cetera. And <clears throat> the need for coordination means that individual processors or, or nodes, services, can't make progress individually, but they have to wait for consensus. They have to wait for others. And as, as, as Depeche or Martin Gore's sort of song, uh, and enjoy the silence. Words are unnecessary. They can only do harm. We need to learn to enjoy the silence. We, essentially, we need to learn to shut up, right? When designing microservices, we, we, need, we therefore need to sort of minimize the service-to-service -service communication and coordination of state. As Bob Monkhouse says, silence is not only golden, it's seldom misquoted. Which is, I, lo I, lo I love that quote. We have to rely on eventual consistency to pull this off. But we shouldn't be surprised, right? Because eventual consistency, that's how the world works. That's how we all function every day, all the time. We just don't think about it like that. So again, don't fight reality, embrace reality, and start exploiting it, let's say. That will make life easier. And again, no one wants eventual consistency. It's a necessary evil. It's not cool. It's useful, okay? Because it can really help us building systems that can truly scale. And I will, now we'll look sort of at three different tools to help us with this. So first is event-first design, uh, or first event-first domain-driven design. <clears throat> That's sort of a new, 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 new word for a thing that people have been doing for quite some time. So. Uh, but I'll, I'll walk through. I think that's a very good lens of sort of to look at when you design the system. The other one is reactive design principles. To take a look a little bit how they can help. And finally, event-based persistence. 
So I think, I think domain-driven design is a great tool. I mean, I've used it f since Eric Evans' first book came out, right? But, but it's often used quite wrongly, especially in this, in this, in this new world, because it, 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 sort of, it has historically said that you should focus on domain objects. I, I, think, I don't think really Eric, Eric ever say, say, really says that, but that's how it's been implemented. Looking at sort of the nuns, what are the things in the system, you know? A car, a house, etc. Things like that, and that sort of forces us to focus on structure too early in the in the system. Instead, I think we should we should we should practice what is then called events first domain dri dri driven design. So instead of focusing on, on the things, the nuns in the system, we should focus on what happens, which turns out to be the events in the system. Okay, and we should let the events sort of define our bounded context. If you don't know what that is, I mean, I won't have time to go through into domain-driven design principles here, but, but, domain, but the, the boundary concept essentially defines sort of the a boundary for, for our domain, where we can use one, one sort of language to talk about things and, 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 and have the domain sort of not leak outside, usually sort of fronted with some anti-corruption anti layer where we can, <clears throat> we can sort of taking events from some other domain, translate them if necessary, and also protect ourselves if, 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 if invalid data comes in, et cetera. So there's sort of a box. Uh, um, so events represents facts. Okay, okay, always represents facts. So what is, a, what is a fact? Fact is something that happened in the past. Facts are immutable. F you can't possibly change facts. You know, facts just accrue. You can, you, they accrue by either you adding completely new facts to the system, so they arrive in the system, you, you make them up, or you derive new facts from historical facts. That, that's also okay. I mean, sort of mining and knowledge and getting more knowledge out. That, that's quite a common thing, okay? And here we're not talking about alternative facts, sir, but true, true, real facts. Sorry, I just had, I just had to. Make a joke there, no one got it. But anyway, my, my son found it really funny. <laughs> uh, so you, sh you should ask yourselves, what are the facts, right? Mine them, just like a detective. Coming out of the crime scene and see what are the facts here? Okay, trying to define sort of a, a, an order of events, a causal order of what happened here. And something that can be really useful to doing that is a, new, is a technique that are sort of starting to become popular the last years five years, just three, four years, something like that, called event store. I mean, where so you sort of bring all the stakeholders into one single room, domain experts, sort of, uh, programmers, etc., <clears throat> and have them brainstorm on a whiteboard. There's a different color for different type of events, I said. But essentially, just getting all the events, everything that's happened in the system out there, and then you can start them I mean, looking at, 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 at how they are connected, who, who's causing what, uh, things that, that cause the event, or usually commands coming in from, from, the, from the client or from, from some user, et cetera. And, and then try to find the domain language, like from starting from from the events, and then trying to understand how I say as I said I said uh, how ends, uh, ev events are causally related, how facts sort of flow in the system, right? Because that's really how the system works, which is which is the essence of you know business value and, and business semantics, etc. So one centralized way of, of, of defining causalities is, is using event logging that we'll take a look at soon. Another one is sort of a distributed approach is using something like vector clocks and conflict-free data types, C CRDTs, etc. to try to make sense of facts and how, and how they are causally related. Okay. And really important to, to also to, to think in terms of what I call consistency boundaries. Try to minimize the, the boundaries of, 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 of the data that has to be consistency. We often tend to, to start with the behavior when we design systems, you know. Oh. Instead, we should start with the data, I believe, the facts, how data interacts, etc. And then try to find out the integrity guarantees for that data from a domain perspective, really. And, and the one, one, once we have that, we should try to minimize this, this data set, the data set that absolutely has to be strongly consistent. And then we add behavior to that, and then we have our service. 
Okay. Pat Helen he defines a really nice framework for how to think about these things and think about consistency in general, where you have inside data, where he talks about our current local present. That's our state, their state in, in our service. We have outside data that he calls blast from the past. That's sort of the commands arriving to the service. And between services, we have what he calls hope for the future. No, sorry, so blast from the past is like the facts arriving, the historic facts that has happened. But, but we, between services, when you ask someone to do something, that's the commands you send. Sort of hope for the future, hoping that someone else will take you on on that task and execute it for you. Okay. So aggregates is really, is from a domain perspective, really what sums all of that up. That can be your consistency boundary, your unit of consistency, but also your unit of failure. But it's extremely important that this unit of consistency fails in isolation and is restored in isolation to ensure that you have this at, at, the atomicity and the, and the sort of transactional guarantees intact. It also needs to be migrated if it's, if it's, and replicated sort of as one thing. If you start splitting up and aggregate, the, the, you're, then you're, you're in problem. You have problems, I believe. And, 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 uh, but, but an aggregate usually consists of multiple entities, right? So, so the, 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 there, there can be a need to sort of coordinate between the, these different entities in terms of work, et cetera. And that's usually done using something like a process manager. I, I, I won't have time to go through that, but, but uh, you, you, you can look it up. It's also important to understand that, I mean, even though I talk a lot about mutable data, the mutable and sort of immutable data, mutable states, just, uh, I believe, still has its place, but it needs to be contained, okay? Mutable states should only be for, for local computation within this safe haven of the consistency boundary. It should always be non-observable to the rest of the world. So you can do your, your computations using mutable state because that often simplifies things. Uh, Scala, for example, is a language that allows you to do, you to do both use, use immutable values as, 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 as well as mutable uh, sort of fields, references. Uh, simply, often for, for performance reasons and, and clarity reasons, etc. But, but so that, I think it's okay to, to use that within the service, but as soon as you're done with your result, create a fact out of it and publish that to the rest of the world. That means that others can actually rely on stable values and not something that can just change while they are looking at it, okay? The, 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 this sort of ties into React with design principles, which is the second sort of tool in the toolbox. There's been a sort of a lot of confusion around React. I mean, React started, started a few years ago. It was defined sort of by the React Manifesto, but it's been around a little bit longer using like things like functional reactive programming, which is not really not <coughs> what we now talk about when we talk about reactive. Uh, it's, it's more an academic approach. Uh, uh, and uh, I believe, I mean, so, so, so people talk usually about two things, reactive programming and reactive systems. I believe that reactive programming is a subset of reactive systems. And both are in, in extremely important by the different levels in your design. So reactive programming is all about making the individual instance highly performant and efficient. It has sort of a local focus within your, your, your service, your, your component or whatever. You utilize things like asynchronous sort of execution, things like non-blocking execution. It's usually event-driven, meaning that you, you publish facts to anonymous subscribers. Well, reactive systems, on the, on the, on the other hand, so tries to take a holistic view on system design in general, across, working with the space in between these services, trying to make so systems elastic and resilient. And, and it has, so it has a, not a local focus, but a distributed focus. And it relies not on event-driven programming, but, but on message-driven programming. Messaging is all about communication. You know, sending sort of facts or commands asynchronously to some other party that they can react upon. And, in, and, and, and this gives us a lot of things like location transparency that, give, that allows for mobility and these services to move, to move around without the caller or the user of that service to know where he currently resides because you have this, the, the, the asynchronous boundary that messaging allows you, gives you this decoupling that allows you to have a reference and not really caring about the lo 
the current location of the service that you're calling, which, which is a huge benefit. This also gives, gives us things like opens up for supervision, self-healing, etc. because systems can be restored at, and, and self-heal while the, the guy that's using them can still be up and, 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 and function. Instead of, you know, these cascading failures, ripple effects that you often see where you have st strong, consistent, or st uh, sort of strong coupling between ser services. So I think, really think that we need to fully embrace asyn asynchronicity whenever, when, whenever possible. Asynchronous and non-blocking communication, as I said, is all about efficient use of resources, okay? Try to minimize contention. Try to minimize the coherency cost. Minimize the cost of Amdahl and, on the, and the universal scalability law. Because it's really, <laughs> contention is really the biggest scalability killer there is. And we should always apply back pressure. So the back pressure is all about the fast system shouldn't overload a slow system. And I think this illustration sort of explains why that could be useful. It's sort of a, it's a little movie I found in a completely different context, but it very well <laughs> explains the need for back pressure. Okay, because here clearly the producer fully overwhelms the, con the consumer. Okay, so there, there's a need for some, some sort of continuous feedback that, that, so the consumer can say, please slow down, I can't keep up anymore. And, and, and one really nice specification that Lightband started uh, and we did together with the Netflix, Pivotal, Oracle, Red Hat, uh, and Twitter is the reactive stream specification. We serve a specification that allows you to have multiple sort of stream-based implementations collaborate with, with the spec specified way of doing these sort of handoffs and, and, and hints back. So one, for example, system built in Akka streams can't overwhelm one using Reactor or RxJava, et cetera, or, or or Kafka, if you use the reactive Kafka driver that we wrote, et cetera. All right, so this is a growing ecosystem of making sense of streaming uh, in, a, in, a, in a reliable fashion. So we need to extend the model now so you're using things like asynchronous streaming, asynchronous messaging, streaming, as, as well as synchronous request reply, because I think the thing still think rest, synchronous rest has its place. It just shouldn't be the default. It shouldn't be what you always rely. It shouldn't be what you rely on, what you grab first. I think asynchronous messaging should really be the default. And if you, if you find a problem where you have to use synchronous HTTP over REST, then, then I mean, you have made that trade-off. You know why you did it. It's not just something that happened because everyone else is doing it like that. So, so, then, so then if we then try to apply, so apply reactive programming to our micro lists, we, 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 we sort of end up with, with, with something like this. Alongside REST, we have messaging and streaming. Uh, and, 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 we, and we hopefully sort of use sort of back pressure I mean, sort of, sort of between. We, we hopefully rely on asynchronous JDBC drivers. If there are, there aren't that many. It's just a really sad story out, out there. I mean, Postgres and MySQL has some, and et cetera. Or we rely on, 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 a, on a NoSQL database that does support for, 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 for non-blocking persistence. Circuit breaker is another thing that falls into this category. Etc. Et so I think we're getting there, but the problem is that we still have a single instance microservice, which is not scalable and not resilient. So what do we do here now then? It's really important to understand that microservices, they, they don't just come in systems, they come as systems. So what do I mean by that? I, I, I mean that each microservice need to be designed as a distributed system in itself. I think that's extremely important. I mean, uh, uh, systems are, you know, with lots of parts, distributed parts that together sort of compose this, this microservice. So in, in essence, we need to move from microliths to microsystems, okay? To, to sort of microservices that embodies distributed system from the inside. Not just to happen to play in it, right? And if it works, it works. And, and it can often, on the path theory, it can often be helpful to sort of separate the stateless behavioral part from the, st from the stateful part, what we usually call the entity here. 
Uh, so we, then we can end up with something like this, right? You have one single microservice here, you split up the, sort of the, the stateless behavior, there's a green box on the top with the, st with the stateful aggregate here, and you use sort of commands to communicate between these. Okay. The, it, might, it, might, it looks a bit more complicated, but, but it opens up for a lot of things, right? It, and it could be, and now you can run them on, on multiple nodes or run them in process. That it depends if you what you what, how you need to, to to scale it because you know scaling the stateless part is very very easy. It can usually be scaled almost linearly. I mean, you I mean as I mean, Amazon Lambda and all this this sort of serverless function as a serviceless function as a service movement have sort of proven that it can be it can be scaled very easily. Right? The hard thing is state, which is also why, you, why fu function as a service more or less ignores that problem. We, we, I'm sure we will get there soon, serverless type of, uh, sort of opsless type of wor world where we can sort of work with state in a semantic fashion inside the application, not just like exter ex externalize it. But you, because you know scaling state is actually quite hard. We'll look at it at, at a t technique for, for 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 that quite shortly. But it's also very important, sort of just, just ignoring the problem by by sort of calling it stateless. You know, by having sort of stateless services like shoehorn their the, their state down into some some other storage. I think I think uh, might work in some cases absolutely, but as a general thing, it will just make the make the problem harder for us because we're delegating one of the most important pieces of our functionality over, or, uh, and pieces of the system to someone else, We're making it hard to control in terms of data integrity, scalability, availability guarantees, et cetera. I think it's better to, take, to fully embrace state as part of the essence of the application of the service and own it, right? The entity can also become sort of escape route from reality. We have within sort of the, a safe island where you can sort of actually en en ensure strong consistency. Uh, uh, an island that we can sort of live happily under the illusion that, that the time is absolute, that the present is absolute, right? It's just an illusion, but if we minimize the scope of it, we can actually get, get by while, while not sacrificing scalability and, re and reliability. Okay, so, so now, sir, we can scale each 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 one of these independent of each other, and 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 so you can, you can sort of scale the the top stateless part to I mean ten, one hundred nodes or whatever. I mean, if it's a really processing heavy heavy system, then you probably want to scale that out to a lot more nodes than you want to scale out the distributed or the or part or, or sorry the stateful part and the or the or the database parts or vice or vice versa. But now you have options. You can scale them into to, into sort of different axes or different dimensions, so 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 to speak. Reactive systems can also make really help make the microservice or resilient and fully elastic and scalable. I mean, you can, learn, you can read more on the reactive manifesto here, but as I said, reactive systems are, are, are based on asynchronous message passing. And, and that sort of enables just to break free of the loose coupling. You have a, an asynchronous boundary sort of between these services that allows them to evolve into, into independently of each other. Full isolation, which means the one can crash and come up without affecting the rest of the system, et, et cetera. And, and, and having this asynchronous boundary means that we can, we can decouple them and their communication flow in time. So that allows for concurrency. It can allow for interleaving or, 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 or parallel execution. But it also allows us to decouple them in space, right? That allows for distribution and mobility. So you can decouple them, them alongside these two axes. And this gives us an option for, to, to, to get location transparency. And location transparency is an extremely powerful concept. It allows us to have one single communication abstraction across all dimensions of scale. You know, from core to socket to CPU to container to server to the rack to the data center to the system, etc. And 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 the, the the important piece to understand here is that it gives us one programming model, one set of unified semantics, regardless in which level of scale you're, you're, you're working with. I mean, we are often used to use different sort of tools for different dimensions of scale. You, you, you perhaps use it like, you know, 
Node.js task styles or event loop for, for interleaving. You use something like, like MPI or, 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 or ACA or something, you know, or, or, or threads and locks for, for, for scaling out to multiple cores. And when we, when we take nodes and the network into, 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 into sort of account, then we need to rely on sort of message-oriented middleware, JMS or EJBs, God forbid, or something like that. It's et cetera, et cetera, right? So when we, when we climb up the ladder of abstraction or scale, we need to use different tools, which is extremely confusing. It's really not the way it has to be, because that also means that we are locked into different levels here. I mean, a thread a sort of system written on using threads and locks can't just become, you know, scaled across machines, for example. They need to use another tool, etc. So the, the, the topology and the solution is locked in on each layer, while location transparency and asynchronous message passing is really an abstraction that works across all these dimensions of scale. Instead of just trying to hide it, you know, like we've, we've done too many times in the past, you know, RPC trying to make, make a, a sort of distributed invocation look like local or EJBs or transactions is also a way of trying to hide the complexity of the network instead of embracing it and take advantage of it. I believe. Location transparency also so gives us uh, options for mobility, dynamicity, and adaptability. Moving things around without affecting the, the system, the rest of the system that is using the service that is being moved around. So it, it means that, that, that they can stay oblivious of the topology that the system currently has. With something that can and often will change dynamically as the system needs to scale b based on demand, you know. Black Friday or Christmas or whatever, you should, you, that should all ha sure happen without you having to, to, to sort of design for that up front, so to speak. By using the right abstraction from the start, the system just, can just do that automatically. And uh, so, the, the, so the, the path towards resilience really goes through building decentralized systems, things like bulkheading, replication, et cetera, supervision. What you get through that is, is, is being able to build truly self-healing systems. And this is what reactive systems really enable us. It also gives us tools for building a tru truly elastic systems, also through decentralized architecture, things like epidemic gossiping, self-organization, and location transparency. Okay. So if, if, if we then uh, apply these, these techniques to this, to this uh, microsystem, it can look something like this, right? Right, and then it's also very important to actually see things like authentication, service discovery, etc., as part of the system. Often, it's helpful to see the client as part of the system because they all interact as one single system. I, I, I believe. Okay. Finally, event-based persistence can, can really help us build truly scalable and, resili and resilient systems. Pat Helen once said that the truth is in the log. The database is the cache of the subset of the log. You know that disk space used to be very, very expensive, which is the reason why most SQL databases historically have used in-place update, you know, destructive writes, overwriting existing data because you, you simply couldn't keep all state around. It was just too expensive. But today, there's really no reason at all to use in-place update. We, can, we, can, we have so disk space is extremely cheap, so we, we, we can sort of keep data around forever. So the question is, why should we work with the cache of a subset of the, of when we can work with the real thing? And the real thing is a log. You know, most uh, or all transaction or sort of SQL databases, you use transaction logs underneath. It's just they are not exposed to us. We have to work with tables and, and create, read, update, and delete. I really be believe the create, read, update, delete, known as CRUD, is dead. We don't need update and delete anymore. You should just use create. Sort of new facts are created or they are read. We use read. So we just add more knowledge or we draw conclusions. We never update. We can't, I mean, facts are immutable. We, you, you just can't update them. And facts can never be deleted. Something happened ha has happened, really. So if you want to match reality and the way things work in real life, we, should, we can only create new facts and read facts, really. And one model that sort of take advantage of that is event logging. 
I think it's the best way to, to really work with, with facts. It's a very natural way of working with facts. We store them in an event log in the order they arrive. That's the causal order of the system. That's the way they actually happened. <coughs> You can, you can, you can timestamp them when they are created, and you know exactly how they are, so what, what's causing what, et cetera. And event sourcing is a great tool, to, to, sort of pattern, to make sense of event logging. I'm sure you've heard of, of event sourcing, where you store event in, in, an, in an event log. Event sourcing allows you to sort of replay it at any point in time, Anywhere, you know, so for auditing reasons, for replication reasons, you can replay it and bring up a new instance somewhere, somewhere. If something fails, you can replay it and bring up the old instance, etc. It fits also very, very, very well with messaging, I believe, and in a sort of event-driven architecture, because you already have these events flowing around, like the, 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 the design that came out of event storming, for example. And the, the log is just, is, is actually a database of the past. It's not just a database of the present that we are used to. Everything is there. And time is an index, which is also a very natural way to think about it. Which means that you can actually go back in time and replay from any index. Event logging also gives us a way to avoid this infamous object relational impedance mis mismatch, where you know when you have your object model, domain objects, and you have your relational model, you, you need to use something like JPA or Hibernate to map in between. We've all been there. It's, it's, it's a, a mess. It's, and it's way too often sort of puts us in, in a corner where we really no, have really no good way to out of it. Well, event logging sort of allows us to use an in-memory representation of the state in the, in the object itself that you, can, that, that you can use with, that is backed by the event log on disk that represents the truth. So there, there's no mapping at all going on. As the events arrive into, the, into, the, into your service, they're logged and they are applied to the, to the in-memory state of the of, this, of the service. Another great pattern to layer on top of event sourcing is, is something called CKRS. Uh, it was, 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 uh, was something that sort of was invented by Greg Young. It, it, it stands for query, uh, so sort, of, no, sort of command query, responsibility, segre segregation. And it's, it's, it's really about untangling the read side from the write side. Okay? So you separate the way you look at reads from the way you look at writes. And the, and the benefit of this is that it gives us a, a chance to, have this, to store the right side, the source, source of truth, in the most optimal format for that. If we use facts, I've already said, I believe that's a log. But you know, the log is quite hard, hard to, to use for querying, especially things like joins and all kinds of stuff. So you don't want to do that. CQRS gives us a solution for that by allowing us to store the query side in the optimal format for querying. And that, that, that's use case specific. It might be a graph database, it might you mean, a, mean a column or a key value store, it might be a SQL database. I don't know. But you, you can store them separate, independent of each other, um, sort, of, um, op sort of optimize the use for the current use case. But it also gives us a way to, to sort of scale these completely uh, alongside two different axes. It might be, the, be that you have a right side heavy system. I mean, then you can scale the right side a lot more than you can scale the read side, or the other way around. It might be that you're fine. I mean, you, you don't have that many transactions per second, but you, you do a ton of reading. Then you can scale out the read side using Cassandra or something like that, while one single event log and one like single writer principle, just one service writing himself to the log might be sufficient, etc. So that gives us a lot of options, say, for how to scale and how to make the service resilient. So uh, I can't see here. I have to look at this. But but if if, if we look at at, at sort of, sort of our sort of micro, my, my, our microsystem now taking to the next level here by by adding event logging and seek and seek your so you can, you can see that you have you have sort of the event sort of the commands arriving from the service into your stateless behavior that is sort of scaled out in whatever fashion you need so you can have sort of load balance redirect to whatever 
some sort of stateless uh, piece of your service that can take the request. Whenever that's happened, it creates a command that is sent down to your source of truth. That is sort of the, uh, the aggregate. And the aggregate can, can sort of reply the, the state change, create the fact that is then stored into the event log. The event log being the source of the, the, the source of truth, but then you can also sort of have any number of, of listeners to 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 those events that listen in what's happening, and one of them can be the read side, or one you can have multiple read sides if you have if you want to have different representations how you want to qu query the data. You have all these type of options now. So the read side listens for these events and updates its part, so its its view of the world. Uh, um, and, and as I said before, this gives you options sort of to, to make the, each one of these layer, all these four pieces sort of as reliable or as scalable as you need, all working together in a single microsystem, single microservice that is dis sort of distributed and available and scalable from within. But what about transactions? And some people say, yeah, but I just need transactions. So this won't work for me, okay? First, I'd like to say that in general, as Pat Helen says, in general, applications developers simply do not implement large scalable applications assuming distributed transactions. You just have to get over the fact that that's not possible unless, I mean, it's fine that your system is down periodically. Okay, so what should we do then? Yeah, Grace Hopper once said that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to get permission. I think this is really good advice here. If we can't coordinate something, if we, if we can't be certain about something, what do we do? I mean, we, 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 we as humans, we, we usually take an educated guess about something and we, and we, and we do it. And if we're wrong, okay, we apologize and we do perform some sort of compensating action, okay? So we should use a protocol of guests, apologize, and compensate. That should be the default, I think. That's really how the world works and how we work all the time. We just don't think much about it. There's nothing, nothing like X, say, you know, in terms of, of human communication or even, even in, in, in business process in the real world. It's just um, a fabrication that we computer scientists have made up to try to make life easier, you know. Unt and it is easier until you need to think, you, need to, un until you need to go distribute it, where everything falls apart like a card house. Because it's, it's, it's really how the world works, as I said. I mean, I mean, for example, examples are like airlines. They overbook flights all the time, you know, and then try to bribe themselves out of the problem by sort of issuing vouchers and meal vouchers or whatever. I've been there way too many times. I never accept them, by the way. And then you have ATMs, where you have, which actually allows you to withdraw money, even if you can't reach the, 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 the back end mainframe. And if, the, if, if, if then later the network is restored, it sort of deducts that money from your account. And if you didn't have any, it will deduct it to a negative balance. And you will get some sort of mail, say you need, you need to you know, settle this. Else they, they put the police on you, right? So there's always some sort of compensating action that can, ha that can happen later to make things right. And, 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 and one, one good pattern that I don't have time to go through, right? There's one minute left. But that I encourage you to, to, to look at is the saga pattern. That, that gives us a structured way to do sort of guess, apologize, compensate. Where you can sort of split up sort of a, some sort of long running business transactions into multiple steps. Where each step has, has not just an action, but a reversing, compensating action allowing you to have asynchronous communication between each stage. If one stage goes down, it simply sends messages back, say, run your compensating action, and the whole transaction is reversed in the reverse order. Uh, so in summary, I'd say don't build micro lists, right? Microservices, they come in systems, in distributed systems, and also microservices come as systems. I think we need, we, we need to go beyond the, the, fa the, the view that my, each microservice is just one instance you put in a Docker container and you're done. It's way more complicated than that, okay? 
And, you, you, and I said you won't reap the benefits of, of, of that microservices can give you in terms of availability and scale if you, if you think about it like that. You should, so the reactive principles can really help us here, both from working with the, from the inside of the, of the microservice as well as making it work across distributed systems. And, and really good tools here is event-first domain-driven design and event-based persistence. Uh, so one, one framework that we have at Lightman that sort of take advantage of wraps all of these up. Essentially everything I've talked about here is sort of implemented in Logom. Uh, it's powered by Akka and Play. You know, I, people have, you have built systems like this in Akka, for example, for like the last eight years. Logom is a way of wrapping that up in, in, in a sort of a very high level, simple framework that allows you to, 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 to do what, what's necessary with the least amount of work. So go to logonframework.com or uh, Marcus Jura is actually giving a talk on this uh, on Logon at three o'clock, I think it is. So if you're interested, check, check that out. It would probably be more hands-on while this was more trying to explain the, the fundamental design principles so you can apply them to any kind of technology. I also wrote a little book on reactive microservice architecture. You can download, download it from this bit.ly link, it's free. So that's all I had, thank you.